Okay. 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 Namaskar Bharat, may we please stand for the national anthem. Hello, good evening. Welcome to the launch of LinkedIn Local Jalandhar. Bharat ki Swatantra Divas par sabhi ko hardik badhaiya aur shubhkamnaye. Aaj ki sham ek khas sham hai and I am looking forward to learn a lot from all the distinguished and decorated gentlemen that are available in our panel today for us. Without further ado, let me ask Ishita to come and talk about a little bit about this evening and we'll get formally started. Over to you, Ishika. Thank you, ma'am. Vatan hamara aisa, koi na chhod paay. Rishta aisa, rishta hamara aisa, koi na tod paay. Dil ek hai, jaan ek hai hamari. Ham hindustani hai, yehi shaan hai hamari. Kuch inhi shabdo ke saath, mein aap sabhi ka hardik swagat karti hoon. Mein Ishika Malhotra, LPO University से आप सभी का हार्दिक स्वागत करती हूं और आप सभी को स्वतंत्रता दिवस की अनेक शुभकामनाएं देती हूं और आशा करती हूं आप सभी स्वस्थ होंगे आज हमारे देश को आजाद हुए चौहत्तर वर्ष हुए इन चौहत्तर वर्षों में हमारे देश ने सभी वर्गों में अपनी उन्नति की है प्रयास किए हैं और विकास किया है और आशा करती हूँ आगे भी करते रहेंगे आज हमारा देश आत्मनिर्भर भारत की तो और भी चल की तरह चल रहा है और आशा करती हूँ कि एक ना एक दिन ऐसा अवश्य होगा कि हमारा देश आत्मनिर्भर बन जाएगा आज हमारा देश पूरे विश्व भर में प्रसिद्ध है मैं मानती हूँ कि पिछले कई वर्षों में हमारे देश ने कई बार विकास किया है परंतु तो ये कहना भी उचित होगा कि आज भी हमारा देश पुरानी रूढ़ियों पुरानी सोच पे निर्भर है क्यों आज भी हमारे देश में भ्रष्टाचार है क्यों आज भी हमारे देश में बलात्कार होते हैं क्यों आज भी हमारा देश धर्म के नाम पे लड़ाइया करता है ये सब सोच को हटाने के लिए सकारात्मक ऊर्जा की आवश्यकता है और वो सकारात्मक ऊर्जा और कोई नहीं पैदा करेगा वो युवा पैदा करने वाला हमारी युवा पीढ़ी है आज का युवा जो बहुत दृढ़ है 
जो निर्भर है जो हमारे देश को एक विकास की धारा पे लेके जा सकता है हमा, हमें स्वतंत्र बनाने के लिए हमारी सोच में स्वतंत्रता आने की आवश्यकता है तब तो हम कह सकेंगे कि असल मायनों में हमारा देश स्वतंत्र हुआ जब तक नकारात्मक ऊर्जा हमारे देश से नहीं जाती और सकारात्मक ऊर्जा सकारात्मक सोच हमारे देश में नहीं पनपती तब तक नहीं कह सकेंगे कि हमारा देश आगे की ओर जा पाएगा एक अच्छी सोच तब एक अच्छी सोच एक अच्छा प्रयास हमारे देश को स्वतंत्र बनाने में पूर्ण रूप से विकास करेंगे कुछ इन्हीं शब्दों के साथ मैं अपने वचनों का अपने अपने वर्ड्स का विलंब कुछ इन्हीं शब्दों के साथ मैं विराम लेती हूँ और आशा करती हूँ आप सभी स्वस्थ रहेंगे धन्यवाद जय हिंद जय भारत I wish you all a very happy Independence Day, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to India's Wars Internal and External, brought to you by LinkedIn Local Jalandhar in collaboration with Student Entrepreneurship Cell, lovely professional university. Ladies and gentlemen, in this evening we are going to have three distinguished veterans who have seen the Indian history, who have been a part of our Indian history, and they have seen the wars. Ladies and gentlemen, there are so many things to learn, to get inspiration, and to get inspired from our distinguished veterans. So now, moving forward to this event, I'd like to introduce you all with our panel for this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have retired Lieutenant General S. A. Hasan. He has honored with Param Vishist Seva Medal, Uttam Yuddh Seva Medal, Ati Vishist Seva Medal, Sena Medal, Vishist Seva Medal, and He is also the former GOC 15 Corps at Srinagar. He is currently a member of NDMA and the Honorable Chancellor at Central University Kashmir. Ladies and gentlemen, along with we are going to have retired Lieutenant General Dr. Kansam Himalay Singh. He has been honored with Param Vishist Seva Medal, Uttam Yuddh Seva Medal, Ati Vishist Seva Medal, and Yuddh Seva Medal. Ladies and gentlemen, along with we are going to have retired Colonel S. Dini. He is the former commanding officer of Pangong So Battalion. He was also the former faculty at Defence Service Staff College. Ladies and gentlemen, and this panel is going to be moderated by Miss Preeti Chaudhary, Colonel Amit Verma, and Mr. Vivek Chadha. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to give. I like to tell all of you, please give a huge round of applause for all our panelists for this evening. Now, moving forward to this event, I would like to give this platform over to Miss Preeti Chaudhary. Good evening, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you for that, Nitish. And wonderful, wonderful context setting for the entire evening. I hope you learn a lot as much as I am looking forward to learning from our distinguished panel. With that, let us officially begin the evening, and I would call upon my dear friend and co-host Vivek Chadha to take the proceedings on. Over to you, Vivek. Thank you. Thank you, Preeti. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to all. It gives me immense pleasure to announce the launch of our LinkedIn Local Jalandhar chapter on this auspicious day. Thank you for your services, dear members of the panel, and a very happy Independence to everybody. The theme for today is India's wars, internal and external, revisiting modern India's military history. My name is Vivek Chadha, and I, along with P. P. Chaudhary and Colonel Amit Verma, retired, will be your host for today. We have a stellar panel lineup today, and I'm very happy to introduce them. Again, uh, we have with us Lieutenant General Syed Atta Hasan, P. B. S. M. U. Y. S. M. K. B. S. M. S. M. B. S. M. and Bar. former goc 15 corps shrinagar currently member ndma and chancellor central university kashmir welcome sir we also have lieutenant general dr konsam himalay singh retired pvsm uism avsm ysm welcome sir and we have colonel s dini retired former commanding officer pangong so battalion and former faculty at defense services staff college welcome sir i heartily welcome all our panelists again and thank you for investing your time to join us today i also thank all our audience for coming and part
participating in today's LinkedIn Local India Online. Hope that you derive immense value from the same. For the questions, uh, please keep them ready and put them in the chat box that you see at the bottom of the screens. Uh, without much further ado, I request Preeti to introduce uh, LinkedIn Local to all of us. Thank you. Thank you for that, Vivek. And once again, thank you very much for your service, gentlemen. And a very happy Independence Day, Bharat Ki Swadantra, Par Sabhi Ko Hardik Hardik Shukamnai. A little bit very quickly upon this whole concept of LinkedIn Local India. LinkedIn Local is a LinkedIn property. It is for the community and by the community kind of business social networking meeting events. With the onset of the pandemic, everything is moved virtually. And so here we are in a virtual form conducting this wonderful webinar for the youth, for everybody else that is interested in military history. With that, I would now invite Colonel Amit Varma to introduce himself to us and we will take the evening forward. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Preeti, and thank you, Vivek. Uh, it's been an association which uh, has crossed the one-year mark now. It's just a year back that I had met Vivek at the Gold Souk and the journey that started with our first event, uh, which again was in August, and there have been so many more. The lockdown has not been able to slow down the spirit of LinkedIn local, and it's not just in India, it's a global phenomenon. What has now happened is we are now we are connecting communities which are not able to meet directly. And LinkedIn local Jalandhar is, an, uh, is a very important step in going local. Because that is where the energy of our youth, of our country is. And many more such chapters will come up. And I hope to be associated with Preeti and Vivek to see this through. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Couldn't have done this all without you. Nice to have you on board. And once again, you know, happy for the friendship that we share. So with that, now my job is to invite the panel for their views on the topic today. And... I know between Nitesh and Vivek, we have spoken about all the decorations that each of these gentlemen have had. But putting that aside for now, I would invite General Sayyid Atta Hasnan for his views on the topic. But before that, I am going to be sp speaking about everything that he has done so far. So as a way of introduction, please give me a couple of minutes while I tell you a little bit about him. Through most of his 40 years illustrious career, General Hasnain has served in turbulent environments and hotspots, from Sri Lanka to Siachen Glacier and Eastern Ladakh, from Northeast Indian state to Jammu and Kashmir, and in UN operations from Mozambique to Rwanda. He served seven tours in JNK, decorated in most of them, and knows the JNK conflict comprehensively. He commanded the Indian Army Srinagar base, 15 corps, and is today one of the foremost writers and analysts on JNK, Pakistan, Middle East, political Islam, and transnational extremist violence. With a strong academic background from Sherwood College, Nainital, St. Stephen's College, Delhi, the Royal College of Defense Studies, and King's College, London, and the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, Hawaii in the US, he has been at the forefront of encouraging the adoption of the US-initiated scholar-warrior concept in the Indian Army. He speaks on national security at various military, civil services, and corporate institutions with a view to enhance India's strategic culture. With an intent to bring national security-oriented strate strategic culture to India's corporate business world, General Hasnain has been leading the march with engagement with some of the major corporate companies and institutions. General Hasnain has six decorations awarded by the president for India and two of the army chiefs. He is superannuated from the Indian Army in July 2013 after 40 years of service. Welcome again, General. Pleasure having you over and it's all yours now to take us through this very interesting part of military history that I, as a layman, absolutely have not much idea of. Thank you once again. It's over to you. Thank you. 
थैंक यू प्रीति थैंक यू कर्नल अमित वर्मा थैंक यू विवेक सच ग्रेट एनर्जी इन द यूथ द यूथ इन यू द ग्रेट एनर्जी विच इज विच इज सो एविडेंट इन दिस इन दिस वेबिनार आई एम सो हैप्पी टू बी विद यू ऑल जय हिंद एंड वेरी हैप्पी इंडिपेंडेंस डे टू एवरी वन हु listening to us or watching watching us and my compliments to my fellow uh, panelists great uh, soldiers both of them both of them from the rajput regiment jankeet singh and uh, colonel dini both of them from the rajput regiment i am from the garhwal rifles three of us are infantry men all three of us right uh, i don't have much time so otherwise i would have gone into many more uh, as formalities of introduction uh, but i must uh, must take out a leaf of what preeti said she spoke about strategic culture is what i am deeply interested in in ensuring the cultivation of strategic culture in india this sub this particular webinar is a great contribution to this fact right i have been doing this for the last 7 years and i intend to do this for many years more but uh, i am very happy to say that there are organizations like yours which are picking up the right threads and ensuring that this is the kind of spread which is required in the country having said that the concept here of external and internal wars uh we spread this between three of us three panelists i will be speaking on the 47 48 war that in german german kashmir briefly on 62 very briefly on 65 1971 and just touch upon the german kashmir sub conventional conflict jol kiet singh will be speaking on 1962 1999 operation vijay which he was a very important part as comes commanding officer of 27 rajput and uh, he will be speaking about the northeast sub conventional operation in the northeast and of course touching upon a number of issues about military history of the indian army and colonel dini who has recently um, um, uh, left the army he has he was uh, just two years ago the commanding officer of the battalion at pangong so where the problem is at the moment on finger 4 to finger 8 so he is going to take on a lot regarding the ladakh issue he is going to speak about sub conventional operations on the line of control he's been the adjutant of 14 rajput with me in uri several years ago and uh, there were he is going to speak of his experience of trans trans lac trans loc kind of operations so i i don't have much time i've already spent a minute and a half of mine 1947 48 let me spend 3 minutes on this at the time of independence partition jammu and kashmir the problem and pakistan's attempt to try and take away the whole of jammu and kashmir forcibly a uh, unique event in the sense pakistan didn't even have an army at that time so they decided to make use of the of the tribals what are called the qabalis lashkars of the qabalis we put them in under arms and launched them into jammu and kashmir to try and get hold of jammu and kashmir before the indian army could get coming at the leadership surprisingly again strange the leadership was both both the armies were led by british generals must be the strangest event in the world where you find two armies fighting but both the armies are led by generals of one country this has never perhaps happened in the history of the world anyway our generals our leaders many of them experienced some second world war but not experienced in the ways of senior leadership so took some time to come into it but uh, let me just outline a few issues here it all started on 22nd of october when they from muzaffarabad uh, the lashkars of the the qabalis attempted to get into uri from uri to baramula and wanted to get to srinagar that was the important thing when, from 22nd they started but in 5 days time the indian army mobilized and launched on 27th october first sikh which landed at the srinagar airfield and took hold of the airfield the moment the airfield was in our hands srinagar was with us the tribals got uh, sucked into battles along the jhelum valley and at baramula particularly they got sucked into into trying to trying to in involve themselves in plunder pillage rape and when you see when armies are made up of this kind of a uh, discipline then this is the state that they have to suffer that they were soundly defeated by the by the indian army and uh, in fact this war lasted for the better part of one year and almost three months it ended on the 5th of january 1949 we got two thirds of jammu and kashmir in our hands one third of jammu and kashmir remained in the pakistan army 
uh, hands. Perhaps if the war had continued, we would have taken the entire Jammu and Kashmir territory, maybe in the next six months to eight months. But it was India was a new nation. India was a young nation. Perhaps the leadership had felt at that time that the United Nations as a new organization could probably help us. And that is the reason why probably the Indian, uh, the Indian leadership went to the United Nations with a hope that it will settle this dispute. That dispute is yet to be settled. What are the landmark landmark names and battles of this, of this war? 27th October, the landing of first Sikh is today counted as the Infantry Day. In the Indian Army, we counted as Infantry Day. And uh, also remember the name of Magbun Sharwani. Magbun Sharwani, a very important character, local Kashmiri, local Kashmiri Muslim from Baramula, who misled the Kabbalis to make sure that they did not move. They did not move to a Srinagar in time. And ultimately, when it was discovered, this young man was captured by the Kabbalis. He was killed mercilessly. He was cut into pieces. First, he was nailed to the to a cross, and then he was cut into pieces. He he there's a there's a unit of the Jammu and Kashmir Light Infantry named on him. It's called Second Jack Ally Bakun Sharwani. Um, most people in the, even in the army perhaps don't know about it. There were some great battles, like uh, there were some great characters and, and leaders like Brigadier Usman, Battle of Noshera, General Harbaksh, the Battle of Tetwal, then Rajinder Singh, Brigadier Rajinder Singh, the Battle of Mohara. He was part of the Jammu and Kashmir, uh, the forces that is part of the Maharaja's forces itself. You had um, at that time Chowang uh, Rinchen, who became a colonel later on, two Mahavir Chakras, who won two Mahavir Chakras uh, in his service in the Indian Army, a Ladakhi national. And you had General Rajinder Singh Sparrow, who led seven cavalry in this amazing operation at Zojila where you took seven cavalry, dismantled the tanks and took them on top of vehicles and put them at Sojila, where they finally fought a battle at 12, 13,000 feet with tanks, first time in the history of warfare. So a lot to learn from it. Of course, lessons uh, can come out subsequently in the question and answer. I won't go into that uh, in detail. In, from 1949 to 1962, in 13 years, the Indian Army should have developed itself. Unfortunately, a lack of strategic understanding in India actually led to the other, it led the Indian army to the other direction. We diluted our capability. We did not get the right equipment. We did not get the right man, amount of manpower. As a result of that, 1962, when the Chinese, who considered India as a natural competitor in Asia, decided that they would teach India a lesson and put it in its place to ensure that China, in, India does not compete with China for strategic space in Asia. We had to, unfortunately, with this war was fought in, 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 in the dark, this war was fought in Arunachal Pradesh, on the McMahon line, on the Johnson line, and uh, we lost the war. We lost the war. But yet, there were classic cases of valor. You had uh, the famous case of 13 Kumal in the Battle of uh, in Chushul, the Battle of uh, Razangla. 130 Jawans were killed. Major Shaitan Singh won the Paramveer Chakra here. You have the famous battle of Nuranang, which is my own battalion, Four Gurwal, lost 147 of the ranks killed here. Three officers, four JCOs in this, the area in front of, uh, ahead, ahead of, of Sela. And uh, this is the place today, revered in the Indian Army, is known as Jaswandgarh. You also, also had uh, other, other great battles in this, Six Kumau, the battle of Valong. You had the battle of two Rajput, the battle of Thabla Ridge, the very, very famous battle of two Rajput. Uh, as a part of 7 Infantry Brigade. These may sound very alien to you, but if you somewhere they stick to your mind, you should Google them and the lots of it is available on, on Wikipedia. Post-1962, we made an ardent effort to develop ourselves. The 7.62 mm rifle, for example, it came after 1962. Till then, 3.03 rifles were being fired. The 81 millimeter mortar came into the Indian Army in 1963-1964. Before that, the 3-inch mortar which almost 2,000 meters less range was, was, was used by the Indian Army. In the intervening period between 1962 and 1965, the Indian Army, in a state of emergency, undertook a tremendous um, uh, uh, campaign to redevelop itself. Unfortunately, the message was also misread on the other side by Pakistan, who felt that the Indian Army, if it is allowed to develop itself in this manner, then the mismatch, there may be develop a mismatch between the Indian Army and the Pakistan Army. Pakistan Army was very much in the American camp and they were getting the best of it. 
the pattern tank, the saber jet, if you remember, these are the kind of uh, equipment which sticks to the mind of people. If, so they were far superior to us in equipment. And they also felt that their fighting prowess of the Pakistani soldier was miles ahead of the Indian soldier. They felt 10 Indian soldiers actually equal one in the Pakistani soldier. It's very surprising because the leadership general, Ayub Khan, was himself from the Indian Army originally. He was part of 14, 14 Punjab. But somehow they forgot all their lessons. So 65 started with a bang uh, in, in, in the month of May. Most people think that 65 war was only fought in August and September. Actually, the war of 65 started from Kutch. Where if the Pakistan, Pakistan attempted to do a what is called a, a, a test, it is trying to establish a testing ground, testing the waters there. It was this war was not fought by the Indian Army, this part in May. It was fought by the CRPS. Most people are not aware of this. That it was a police action. There were police wars going on there for the better part of almost three weeks. Actions against pickets against each other. Ultimately, the issue was resolved through a setting up of a of a tribunal by by, by UK, uh, and, and the problem of Kutch got set aside. But within three months, in the month of August, Pakistan launched what is called the famous Operation Gibraltar. They launched Gibraltar for the purpose of rekindling the Kashmir conflict, hoping like hell that the people of Kashmir themselves will rise. So they trained 40,000 Lashkars again, all from Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, and tried to induct, infiltrate them in the month of July, August. We discovered them early. By our discovering them early, we made sure we went for Haji Peer. We fought the battle of Haji Peer because the Haji Peer bulge was being used for, you know, the basis to infiltrate these infiltrators as a part of Operation Gibraltar. Haji Peer was captured by none other than the very, very famous General Ranjit Dayal, who won Mahavi Chakra in this battle, amazing battle by first para. But there was a series of events which started from here. 26th of August, we got, um, uh, we got, uh, we won the Battle of Bahaji, uh, of Hajipir. And on the 1st of September, the Pakistani launched an operation in Akhnur. They almost came up to the Akhnur Iron Bridge and cut off, almost cut off the road between Jammu and Rajori. We rushed in troops. There are lots of stories behind this. I would love to relate them if I had the time. But um, we managed to stave off the situation. When we, when we managed to stave off the situation, we opened a front and called the Lahore Front. We opened the Lahore front on the 6th of September. And the Pakistanis countered it by the 8th of September by opening another front to the south of Lahore into an area called Asal Uttar. Actually, this is the entire area of southern Punjab. And so these ding-dong battles went on between Indian armor, Pakistan armor. Pakistan almost succeeded actually in breaking through, but somehow the Indian army held on. And finally, we had a large, major uh, in a, a major maneuver into Sialko, which led to the famous battles of Filora, uh, uh, Butur, Dograndi, and places like that. The 65 war ended in a stalemate. Right? It ended in a stalemate, but uh, there are different ways of looking at it. Pakistan's intention was to capture territories that they could not capture. So we claim that since Pakistan did not achieve its aim, we won the war. But Pakistan celebrates 6th of September as its victory day. Because they claim that they won the war, right? Now let me come to, to 71. Six years later, six years later, things change. All of a sudden, the situation presented itself to us in the form of the revolt in East Pakistan. And uh, Pakistan, like always, and this is a lesson you need to take home from this, Pakistan is a past master at initiating conflict. It initiated it in 47, 48. Could not end it. In 65, they initiated, they could not end it. In 71, they initiated it by taking action in, in, in Dhaka, in, Bangla, in, in East Pakistan, but they never foresaw what could happen subsequently. This is the famous time when nine, in nine months, we gave a nine month gap from March to December before we launched the war. And it is famous Field Marshal Manik Shaw who gave his advice to Prime Minister Indira Gandhi that if you want to win this war, don't start fighting this war in March when the problem started. Give time to the army to develop and, and, and prepare itself. And that's exactly what happened. We ultimately, we captured Dhaka. 93,000 prisoners fell in our hands. You must remember this war was with a focus totally on, on East Pakistan, the creation of Bangladesh. Initially, the aim was not to capture Dhaka. But the situation presented itself 
uh, as we went along. And one of the most biggest, uh, one of the finest commanders of this war was Lieutenant General Sagat Singh, who, using a, some tremendous operational art, could actually hurry up the entire operations through some very, very bold decisions. And those led, led us to the, the final victory. As far as our strategy was concerned, on the Western Front, we wanted to do only a holding action. And therefore, a lot of people say, why didn't we do something against West Pakistan? We didn't have the capability, perhaps, to look at both sides and ensure that victory would be there on both sides. We won the war decidedly. But in the West, we, we, it, was, it was virtually a stalemate. We said, no, great territories were captured. Whatever territories were captured were subsequently returned at the Shimla, at the Shimla Agreement. I got the last one minute in which I will only tell you that 71 initiated something which led to 1989. What is 1989? The initiation of the Kashmir conflict, the Kashmir, long 30 year Kashmir conflict. We are in the 31st year of the Kashmir conflict, what's called the proxy conflict today. Why is 1971 the base of it? Because Pakistan is sworn in 1977 when Zia came to power. He swore that he would take revenge for what happened in 1971. What Pakistan awaited was an opportunity. They got the opportunity in 1989 because the situation presented itself in such a manner with the kind of a rebellion which took place in, in Jammu and Kashmir. However, the Indian Army has set it right. I'm sure Colonel Dini will speak more on it. We have stabilized the situation. And once again, we have ensured that something with Pakistan initiated, they could not complete. I have come to the end of my 15 minutes and I'll stop here and wait for your questions subsequently. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Jai Hind, sir. Thank you very much for those enthralling personal experiences. Lot to internalize and I'm sure everybody tuned in today has a lot to bite and chew and digest as well. Because it is not something just about, you know, wars or defeats or victories. It, it's all about how this nation was built in the first place, who all has had a hand in, in that and all the knowledge thereof. So before I move on to our next panelist, here is a quick reminder for everybody attending today. Please put your questions into the question and answer box that you see at the bottom of your screen. There is a live Q&A section at the end of the speaker's view expression. That is when all of your doubts, queries, questions would be answered. So please make sure you write them into the question and answer box. With that, it's over to our next speaker, Lieutenant General Dr. K. Himalay Singh. And before I get on to him, I would like to introduce him as well. Just a little bit about him. He was commissioned in the Rajput Regiment in June, 1978. He's the first Lieutenant General of the Indian Army from the Northeastern region of India. He commanded his unit in Turtuk sector and Siachen glaciers during the Kargil War and was awarded the Yuddha Seva Medal for his role in that particular conflict. He also served as division and corps commander in the state of JNK in counter insurgency and in the line of control environment. He has been chairman of the Public Service Commission of the state of Manipur. He is a member of the consultative group of the state government on Naga Talks. He's presently an advisor and a visiting scholar in the Central University of Manipur in the Department of National Security Studies. He's also an author and has authored a book titled Romancing the LOC, besides regular writings and speaking on various national and international seminars on security matters. Welcome, General Himale. It's over to you now, sir, for your part of the saga in terms of what happened and how it happened. Thank you very much. Thank you, Priti, and uh, greetings to everybody uh, on the occasion of the Independence Day. And uh, good to see each one of you, particularly my co-panelists who are great soldiers whom I have very, very great respects of each one of them. Uh, in the next about 14, 15 minutes, I intend to cover the following. First is a very 
um, short, uh, the introduction has already been given by General Atasnan about 1962 war, and I'll try and put in about three, four minutes of that. And uh, thereafter, I'll touch upon the Kargil War, uh, where I had the privilege to be there in some capacity as a commanding officer of one of the units there. And lastly, I'll cover the issues of the Northeastern insurgency or what we call as subconventional operations in today's time. So coming straight to 1962, the introduction has been given very clearly and lucidly by General Hasnain, and I don't have much to add, except uh, I would like to say, why did it happen? Why did it happen is mostly uh, uh, geopolitical in nature, General Atahasnan said that, and I think my view is that they actually required the Aksai Chin area for the connectivity to the Xinjiang uh, region with uh, other parts of China. That was the main issue, but the boundary issue and also the competi competition for the strategic space that in Asia, because both were rising powers, both had almost the same kind of capacity in terms of economy or developmental indices, you know, it was almost the same. So uh, I think China, uh, one of us, I think, had to push the other, other one and China took the initiative. Some of the reasons, uh, of course, a uh, lot of the lot of people talk about the uh, Dalai Lama's, uh, you know, exit from Tibet, 1959, that rebellion by the Kampa rebellion. The Kampas are the most, uh, fi the fighters of Tibetans are basically Kampas, well-built and their soldiers. So Kampa Rebellion followed by Dalai Lama's coming to India. And thereafter, um, uh, the, as for history will say that Mao Zedong did not have a liking for our prime minister due to whatever reasons he had. And uh, of course, the last straw was about the boundary issue in the Mark Mohan line in the East and Johnson line, uh, as General Hasnain also mentioned in the West, particularly in the North. So uh, primarily the reasons were this, and we also had the various battles, famous battles of Chushul and uh, uh, 13 Kumaons at uh, Rajangla have been mentioned by General Hasnain. But the, uh, the Eastern sector, the Ladakh sector, I think the Indian army did uh, pretty well, you know, we, whatever could be done in the circumstances at that time. But the Eastern sector somehow uh, got a, uh, did not, the individual units and uh, uh, troops, I think they fought extremely well. But it was perhaps the failure at the strategic level, at the, at the very senior military leadership, as well as even political, which led to our not doing so well in the East. My own unit where I was commissioned, the second battalion of the two uh, Rasput regiment itself suffered 282 kill in the battle of Namkachu. One of the most, uh, in fact, the first attack, first attack of 1962 war came to two Rasput in the Namkachu, the, you know, uh, this battle. And uh, uh, one can, one can uh, um, uh, learn more about it in that Himalayan blunder by Brigadier Dalvi, who was the commander of the 7th seven, seven, uh, seven Brigade uh, fighting in that sector, Tawang sector. The overall, the entire uh, effort, in, entire Indian Army's effort, uh, uh, you know, uh, can be gauged by the fact that uh, the troops, uh, we had 1,383 killed in action, about 1,000 wounded and nearly uh, 3,900 or so captured by the, uh, by the Chinese uh, PLA. And not that the Chinese also didn't suffer, they suffered 722 killed as per the official records, but it is likely that it would have been much more, their wounded was more than close to 2,000. So it was uh, uh, well fought by the uh, junior leaders and the soldiers and the unit level. So the, as I said earlier, I think it was at the strategic level and political level and also the senior military leaders who could not match up to the requirements of the day. And uh, 
and uh, you know like uh, now you see that uh, wherever the battle uh, where for that time in the west like say now you heard about the galwan and dbo and demchok and uh, pengong so the similar battles were fought in nearby those areas as well in 1962 so um, overall uh, the the i think overall the it was It's not a good showing by India as a nation, but that actually helped in uh, in uh, bringing up uh, and build, uh, building the Indian Army to a little uh, more. Uh, this thing, as I said, as a prelude to 1965 war. Now coming second, second point that um, my uh, this thing is the Kargil War, very you know very recent and of just about 20 21 years back. It was. Um, I think it was India's uh, one of the finest uh, moments of Indian Army uh, in the initial stages. As you know, that first I'll just uh, try to cover as to why it that uh, Musharraf, General Musharraf, without uh, with the knowledge or without the knowledge of the Prime Minister, why did he actually go in for such an operation? Is that uh, uh, briefly? Uh, I'll just cover one or two points. That is that uh, the insurgency or the Uh, the unrest in JNK, or particularly in the valley, and uh, uh, was coming to some kind of control under control by 1998, 97, 98. Uh, under you know armies, uh, you know excellent showing army and security forces all together. So I think that could have been one of the reasons that to revive this uh, militancy in the Kashmir Valley. And also to internationalize the Kashmir issue in the inter in the in the world uh, in uh, to the world, that was one of the issues. But uh, in my research and also having served towards the you know more towards the glacier Siachen glacier area, I am also convinced that they had they did have a uh, they did have a plan to actually cut off Siachen glacier. That is why they came so close to our national highway number one, Alpha near Dras. You know they wanted to cut off Lay, and also the uh, they had plans to even uh, because Siachen glacier, as you know, is uh, you know Operation Megdul. We actually um, we occupied the Saltoro before they did. And they never had the Siachen story is uh, different. I'm not going to cover here, but the the conflict in Siachen is because of our perception of uh, the you know uh, line of actual control beyond NJ9842. So I think they wanted to take the revenge of uh, Indian Army's success in Operation Megdu. And also, um, General Musharraf, being a commando himself, and he had even uh, been operating in Siachen, he was also very keen. And uh, also, due due to their internal Pakistani uh, political issues, I think General Musharraf took this uh, uh, took this opportunity uh, for uh, launching an operation during the Kargil days. I think we were initially caught by surprise. I was a commanding officer at that time. We didn't have much of intelligence, and whatever came was in bits and pieces without any coherent kind of analysis. Uh, we were at the unit level, whereas uh, the normally the intelligence is, uh, you know, uh, uh, intelligence is um, uh, properly assessed at the higher levels and then passed down. But it was left to us, mostly, you know, at the commanding officers level to uh, find out as to what is happening across. But Indian Army uh, was, uh, it was to the credit of the Indian Army that in spite of the political directive not to cross the line of control and evict those uh, Pakistani intruders who have come in close to right, right from maybe 10 to 15 kilometers at times, you know, they had come with something like with, uh, you know, they had come with regulars and irregulars as well. Mostly it was the NLI, Northern Light Infantry Units, you know, who are uh, generally from their area, uh, not regular, but they were like our um, uh, armed police force kind of uh, the thing. So they had intruded all over the entire frontage, right from north of Georgia, right till glaciers. So approximately a frontage of 150 kilometers. That is what 
um, the, the front, uh, area of the Operation Vijay, which commenced on 6th of May 1999. And uh, the, officially, the Operation Vijay terminated on 26th of July 1999. So during this time, you would have heard uh, this was the first TV war, you know, in, in the country. You must have seen uh, Tololing and Tiger Hill and all because it is bang on the highway. Actually, if you go to Dras, Tololing and uh, from the highway, you can see the Tololing and uh, Tiger Hill. So you saw that. But many more battles are being fought all over to uh, mention a few like Moscow Valley in the Dras and Dras is where the Tiger, uh, Tiger Hill and Tololing is there. Kaksar, Batalik, and Turtuk sector. I was in that uh, area of Turtuk sector, just adjacent to the uh, Siachen uh, Glacier. So um, this was uh, then um, the battles, very, very harsh battles. And, uh, the young officers and our Jawans did a tremendous job. I must tell you that the type of terrain the type of uh, environment there at the icy heights, beyond 15,000 where even your normal, um, you know, just to a normal oxygen is less than half of what you get in an, uh, other places. You know? And you, if you go to height of, uh, my uh, objective, which was given to me was 19,000 feet, which is almost, you know, uh, the as for the, uh, it has just about 27% of the oxygen of the normal, uh, at the normal sea level. So that is the kind of um, uh, terrain there, which in which um, uh, even though it was summertime, let me tell you that, you know, at night, uh, minus, uh, the temperatures used to be uh, less than even minus uh, 15 degrees, minus 20 degrees. Sometimes, you know, with the wind chill factor more than minus 25, 30, you know, there was the kind of this. Young officers, as I said, you must have had number of names, you know, Parambi Chakras, all that, you know, Dilwange more, but I will grant it to each and every Jawan, each and every officer who were there, every armed service they contributed. But the, the, the winning part, the capturing of the, uh, uh, the you, know, you know, regaining the ground, and the lost ground, recapturing all those heights were done by approximately about 50 odd uh, infantry battalions spread all over the, as I said, the entire, entire, entire frontage. The in, it is not that the battle was um, confined to only that 150 kilometers frontage. But other, our, our entire armed forces at various places in LOC, you know, in, um, as I say, in other parts, they were also ready for any kind of this. So they were also, uh, they also contributed. Indian Air Force, you know, you know the uh, story of, uh, uh, you know, uh, flight left, uh, flight left, squad leader, Nachiketa and all. And then Indian Navy was even deployed in the seas. So all this had a cumulative effect in actually winning this war. Though the ground battles were fighting was, uh, you know, confined to the areas north of Jojila Pass till the Shachin Glacier. In the end, we had that approximately 527, uh, we had 527 killed and 1,363 wounded and about 700 uh, Pakistanis are supposed to be killed as per our this. This was a very short this thing about the Kargil uh, days. Now, the third and the last one I'll briefly cover about the subconventional issues, uh, you know, war in Northeast. Most of you know, uh, your participants will know that Northeast is just connected to the rest of India by a very close, you know, um, very uh, uh, narrow uh, Siluguri corridor, which is just about 20, 20 kilometers. And there are more than 300 ethnic groups there in the entire. It has only about 2.5% of the population of the country, but 8.5% of the um, you know, area of our country. Bounded by countries such as 
such as East Pakistan then, now Bangladesh, Myanmar, where there are more than 20 ethnic insurgency groups who are fighting for uh, you know, uh, their um, ethnic uh, groups against the established government in Myanmar, do you aid it by China and China to the north? So just see the unstable nature of that region. During the British, most of the areas were kept as, you know, like excluded areas, partially excluded under the Ministry of Foreign uh, External Affairs. So these so many um, regions are there why the Nordistan remain backward, underdeveloped, and under-administered even after the independence. So all this cumulatively led to unrest. It started with identity war, started with you know, ethnic, um, uh, ethnic issues. Thereafter, it got, uh, it got um, uh, you know, uh, people, it became popular because in the name of underdevelopment and uh, neglect by the center and all this. So the first of the um, so insurgent groups by the Naga groups. That is why the Naga insurgency is generally known as the mother of all insurgencies in India. So the, they start in Nagaland. In, in fact, they declared independence on 14th of one day prior to our independence day, that is, uh, you know, 15th of August. Followed by thereafter, the Manipuri groups for independence from India, the Mijo, Mijo groups, Mijo that time, you know, Mijo hostile, they used to be known as in Mijoram, 1963. And then in Assam, you know, Ulfa, United Liberation Front of Assam, and then Bodoland. So if you see, there are these there are ethnic wars, ethnic conflicts, then, you know, some are fighting for uh, independence, some are fighting for their ethnic space in the democratic uh, environment of the country. So therefore, at one time, there were more than 40 odd insurgent groups in India. Even now, there are more than 30. Many have come out uh, for the talks and they have signed like Mizoram is a success story, then Bodo Loen, you know, Bodo Accord has been success story, and uh, Naga talks are going on, and then uh, the, the, uh, the militant groups of Manipur are yet to come to the table. So all this are going on, the entire government machinery is, uh, even now, uh, as we talk today, you must have read in the papers about the NSCNIM and uh, Naga talks. I have finished my uh, 15 minutes, and should there be any uh, any clarifications or anything, we'll talk in the question answers session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, General, for that. It is an eye-opening history of the Northeast, somewhere which is so beautiful, yet, you know, so many sort of differences there in terms of development, in terms of accessibility, and so many other factors. So thank you very much for that. A quick reminder once again, please, to all the attendees, we are going to go live after Colonel Dini has shared his views. So please make sure that you start putting your questions into the question and answer box of this live, which is just under the screens. So with that, I come on to Colonel S. Dini. And before I request him to express his views on the topic today, here is a little bit more about Colonel Dini. So he's a former commanding officer of Pangong So Battalion and former faculty at Defense Services Staff College. He served as an Indian Army Infantry Rajput Regiment for about 22 years. First hand combat operational experience after having served in multiple tenures in Kashmir Valley, Northeast India, and along the line of actual control in Ladakh. In Kashmir, he served for eight years, both along the line of control and in the Rashtriya Rifles. 
He has served as a military observer with the UN in Congo, commanded an infantry battalion at Pangong So for two years. After command of his battalion, he was nominated for the prestigious Higher Defense Management course. Posted as a fac faculty in Defense Services Staff College, DSSC, in Wellington, Tamil Nadu. He took voluntary retirement from the Army on October 1, 2019. He is a Master's in Defense and Strategic study Studies from Madras University. He completed a graduate certification course in Strategic Studies from Takshila Institution, Bangalore. Undertaken the Cotillier Fellowship Program with India Foundation. He's currently pursuing his MPhil in Defense and Strategic Studies from Madras University. His field of interest includes strategic studies, counterterrorism, leadership, civil military relationships, and nation building. He has contributed articles in Swarajya magazine, The Print, Rediff.com, USI publications, moneycontrol.com, and Malayalam newspapers. He has been a part of panel discussions on strategic affairs in various English, Hindi, and Malayalam news channel. Welcome once again, Colonel Dini. Pleasure having you on board here. Thank you for your service and a very happy Independence Day to you as well, once again. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Quick Thank reminder you. of the topic once again, India's wars internal and external and your journey, sir, through the years and your stories and your inspiration to share. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that wonderful intro introduction. Uh, at the outset, greetings to all on our Independence Day today. For me personally, it's a very special day for me because I'm in such an elite panel. Uh, both the generals are uh, true ambassadors of the Indian Army uh, because they are a rare combination, if I can put it that way, of uh, being thoroughbred ground soldiers, yet a scholar of a very high order. And more than anything else, they are wonderful human beings, both of them I know personally. So it's really, uh, uh, for me, it's a, uh, I, I don't have words to express to be just to be part of uh, this wonderful panel. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you for, uh, you know, uh, making me part of this panel. So uh, my job today now is to uh, cover uh, three sub topics, basically. One is the line of control operations, and then uh, subconventional operations in Kashmir. And then we go on to the line of actual control. So in the, in the four, uh, 14 minutes or so, which I have, so I intend to cover seven, seven minutes each of both line of control and subconventional one side, and then line of actual control on the other side. So uh, General Hasnan has brilliantly put, uh, set the stage at why uh, uh, Kashmir, uh, Kashmir issue uh, started from 1989. So I'm not going to go into that. So let me just straight away go into uh, the uh, how after 1989, the operations along the line of control and inside the, into the hinterland started and why, how is it evolved over the, over the past so many years. So line of control, as we know, in 1970, after 1971, it was, it was quite peaceful till about 1989. And even then, there were minor kind of issues, but there were no major problems as far as the line of control management was concerned. So the Indian Army was prim primarily in, on a border management sort of a, uh, of a, of a role, rather than you know, in any, any other uh, you know, in, in an anti-infiltration uh, sort of a role. So after 1989, saw a huge influx of uh, terrorists which were trained from Pakistan into Kashmir and therefore you know overnight if I can put it the in role of the Indian army changed both in the hinterland and along the line of control so the line of control which was fairly uh, spread whether the, the troop density was very low now you had a huge number of troops coming there and uh, taking up positions in such a manner that you stop the terrorists from getting in so that was the first task which was given was an anti-infiltration kind of a role so you had to occupy you have to leave a lot of lessons which were otherwise followed in a classical mountain warfare sort of scenario which the indian army follows but now we took up we made modifications on ground so that we could stop the terrorists from entering into our territory and secondly, this also gave uh, 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 this was also a period in which uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, uh, you know, on a constant basis, tried to uh, grab as much as land as much uh, in Kashmir. So there was also a need to stop this grab action, and therefore there was actions 
carried out on ground so as so that no inch of territory was lost to uh, pakistan in any form and um, uh, as we saw that it, it in, in 1999 they went on all out, all out operation so that they could uh, capture a, a part of uh, kashmir through force which of course they could not do it so this was the scenario in which the line of control from being a a border management sort of thing it evolved itself into an anti infiltration and also it the the troop con, uh, a number of troops reached to such a, le a level that where there was eyeball to eyeball contact between indian troops and pakistani troops so virtually all each inch of the territory was now being occupied on ground and therefore there was an evolution also which was there earlier uh, there were troops which was there now the troops uh, as i said mentioned earlier they modified their operations they started putting ambushes and somewhere down the uh, about 2003 four uh, and uh, after that uh, the anti infiltration obstacle system also came into play wherein the obstacle system also was ensured so that this uh, uh, the terrorists now faced an obstacle system which was which had a multi kind of a thing which in which had Uh, you know uh, various kinds of means to stop the terrorists there itself so that was the kind of line of control operations which was carried out basically it, um, it was made more of anti infiltration mode now once these terrorists started coming in we all know that they had a base in pa pakistan occupied kashmir from where they were pushed in through guides and then they used to come into the hinterland so the first tier of uh, defenses was along the line of control and then we had another tier of defenses of the indian army occupying in the second tier so that those terrorists which were escaped from the line of control were now trying being trying to uh, uh, neutralize in the second tier of uh, of the line of control and after that was the hinterland operation which which now started gaining uh, you know in 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 a in a big way so what happened was like uh, this is as far as the line of control operations is concerned now coming to the insurgency part Uh, we know that from 1989 this took off in a big way and there were there are various phases of insurgency uh, which from right, right from 1990 which we can see and first is the uprising phase from 1990 to 1995 as if we can put so this is the time when maximum kind of operations the terrorists were coming in a big way after that as as general uh, uh, himalay mentioned that there was a time when the terrorism came down and you know that is a time that is also the reason why kargil happened so from 1996 to 1998 is what they call as the demoralization phase wherein the terrorists were losing their you know the cause and there were people the civilians were also going against them and then 1999 the kargil, kargil war happened and that was the uh, two to three years where what we call the suicide bomb phase when a lot of suicide bombs uh, started happening and in, in in fact 2002 it saw the maximum number of casualties in the valley itself and from 2003 to 2007 is somewhere is the ceasefire period if you can put it wherein there was a, a, when musharraf came into power and there was ceasefire between both the countries and even the line of control had cooled down in a big way and general hasnan and all was part of the uri musaffarabad road initiative all those things started taking place but then after uh, what happened after 2007 uh, a lot of activities then took, uh, took a different direction and from 2008 onwards is what we say the agitational phase in which uh, because of the amarnath yatra because of the afsal guru a stone pelting and agitational dynamics sort of a thing started and this moved right up till 2019 so 2008 to 2019 is the period when this agitational dynamics or agitational phase we can put now 2019 is a very very uh, crucial uh, uh kind of a uh, year in which what happened was in 26 Feb february we had the balakot strike which again was a total different approach in which we had overcome the threshold of all those nuclear kind of threat and we could strike deep inside pakistan territory for carrying out a, a, a terrorist attack in our land so that was one thing and second of course the 5th of august article 370 came into being and then jammu and kashmir never remained the same so 2019 will definitely remain a turning point and from after that the till to 2020 what i call it as the political phase a lot of political activities are starting and hopefully now i think what general hasnan nol was when he was a core commander had visualized then probably now is coming into place and wherein the political uh, leaders and other uh, activities have to start so that whatever uh, action and whatever results of the armed forces on ground is there that can be uh, you know better uh, 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 encashed by this this period so this is as far as the insurgency is con uh, concerned now i move straight into uh, the line of uh, uh, actual uh, control operations so i i basically uh, intend to cover uh, three operations before coming into the Uh, into the current issue of uh, of uh, in pengong so so uh, why I, why i want to cover those issues is also because uh, is that there are a lot of parallels in what happened earlier and what is happening right now 
So let's straight away go into uh, Nathula operations first, which happened immediately after the 1962 war. This was in 1967, and uh, uh, this was between 11th of September 1967 to about 15th of September 1967, just about four days. And of course, um, our own regiment, uh, 18 Rajput, was a part of those uh, operations there. And uh, uh, what happened there again was, you know, that uh, this happened in Nathula, as we know that uh, you know uh, the. There were two shoulders of the pass. One was occupied by the Chinese, and the other was with India. And the Chinese wanted to, you know, come inside in in a in a gradual encroachment sort of thing that was resisted by the Indians by putting a fence, and which was objected to the by the Chinese. And uh, there was a scuffle which took place, and apparently the commissar or the Chinese commissar got uh, bashed up. And they went back and they started firing on the Indian troops. And the initial in uh, the in the initial uh, attack of this firing assault. The, we suffered casualties, but then Indian Army under General Sagat Singh, they retaliated in a big way, and a lot of casualties were were, were on the on the Chinese side. And to the extent that almost uh, Chinese had 340 casualties against our 88. So that was after 1962. It was a bloody nose which we, uh, which the Chinese had, and they never did not uh, they never anticipated that this kind of a reaction will take place. So uh, what are the uh, what all things which we should remember? This after the uh, after this incident, of course, there was also an incident of Chola, uh, which was a few kilometers away from Nathula uh, on 1st of October 1967, where again this thing was repeated and the Gorkhas uh, there gave a bloody nose to the Chinese. So the Chinese, again, in a, in a, in a, in a ma manner which we can now relate to, they mentioned that they did not start the uh, conflict. It was the Indians which tried to change the status quo and it was uh, and they never revealed their casualties. And it uh, so those can, and also one in, inter, interesting report which was from the Western uh, media that uh, the initial uh, conflict or the initial actions were not with the permission of the the Central Military Commission. So that is again a very a thing which is very interesting because those are the things which we keep repeat uh, we keep, we keep hearing uh, more often. Now coming to the after Nathula uh, was 1960s and then we move into the the issue at uh, Sumdurong Chumchu. Uh, that is the incident in 1986. And here, what happened was uh, after um, uh, 71 and India has now regained that moral kind of a thing that we can do, um, you know, uh, operations in a manner which we are known to. What happened was there was also a, 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 con a, a, a deliberate attempt of increasing the forces along the line of actual control. So as part of that plan, uh, it was decided that the Tawang area need to be defended in strength. And so uh, 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 troops were now placed in this area in a more gradual kind of a manner. And uh, in the summer of 1984, uh, in the area of Sundarachung in uh, area, which is near uh, uh, further to the uh, east of Bumla and in that area, what, uh, the, the, there was a post, there was an observation post which was established by the SSB, the, the Special Services Bureau, or the present, it is the Shashastra Sima Bal, a troop of people used to go there. They used to occupy during the summers and they used to vacate during the winters and come back. So this happened for two summers. But in 1986, when the Indian troops went there, they found that already there were about 40 or Chinese already in, in that area. And they, they saw them constructing uh, structures like what we see now. And they made, uh, you know, they made try to make helipads and all those things. And this, they said that this is now our area. We're not going moving back. Now, in, in what India did was that India immediately, uh, uh, you know, mobilized and we moved a brigade sites force on almost in the near vicinity to do it, and without even Chinese realizing that uh, such a thing under General uh, Krishna Swami uh, Sundarji, we moved there and with, within within no time, with the use of helicopters, uh, the, the newly inducted Mi-26, we inducted a brigade size force. After which. Uh, the Chinese got much more agitated and they, they started building up. With, uh, now, uh, because of this, the Indian Army launched an operation itself, a joint Army Air Force operation in which almost uh, the entire uh, army was mobilized along the northern borders and almost a three division size force was now placed in these in, in the near vicinity of this area. So what happened was after some time, this, this, this moved into 1987. And in the summers of 1987, there was uh, there was a talks between uh, the two countries. Our uh, our foreign minister had gone uh, en route to Pyong, uh, to North Korea, and he had stayed there in China. And then it was decided that okay, let's now de-escalate. So that is how this this particular Sundarongcho incident played. So there was a flare up. The Western countries uh, countries had almost predicted that there will be war, but still it didn't happen. And India took a very firm stand. Again, the, the, the narrative which the Chinese would say that we did not change the status quo. It was you who changed it. It was you who uh, you know uh, initiated it. And it was you who uh, 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 was trying to build the infrastructure and all those things. And of, of course, after some time, the, the, the de-escalation took place. 
now and uh, we move to the uh, the uh, the latest issue which is the uh, doklam issue which is just about 3 years back we know that the peculiarity of doklam issue was that this was also along the line of actual control but there here three countries were involved india bhutan and uh, and china so there is an uh, area of doklam plateau which is which is claimed by both uh, bhutan which is in bhutan and but it's claimed by by china as well so uh, uh, during the summer of uh, uh, 2017 on 16th of june Uh, the chinese started making the road from uh, and in the disputed area they already had a road so now they were trying to push it further south and uh, and bring it as close to the india bhutan border so what happened was that uh, then the indian troops crossed the bhutanese border and they stopped this from consider so about 270 odd indian troops crossed and they stopped physically stopped the chinese from constructing this road so there was a face, again a, a face off uh, which took place a standoff which almost went for more than 70 days and after a lot of negotiations both countries now agreed to deescalate and then they moved back now straight away moving back to uh, what is happening now in 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 pengongso area we know on 5th of may uh, this year uh, within this uh, grave crisis of pandemic of uh, pandemic of uh, corona and covid happening in our in, in entire world chinese troops uh, uh, made a four point entry uh, or uh, movement towards four areas in in the eastern ladakh which is from right from uh, pp14 onwards to the area of hot spring and uh, to the area of Uh, uh in the area of gogra and also in the area of pengongso and uh, after that there has been a constant uh, kind of a uh, 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 face off which has happened and but it turned ugly on in in 15th of june uh, uh, uh 2020 when there was a physical clash between both troops on ground while the talks were on and while they were uh, trying to put uh, in place a mechanism of deescalation and uh, of course we had uh, our 20 brave hearts laying the, uh, laid on the lives there of course and also the chinese had a even greater number of casualties which they never brought out as on date what is happening is that the chinese have occupied the area which is disputed between finger 4 and finger 8 rest of the place there is a gap of about 3 kilometers between both the forces the forces are apparently in their own areas of uh, of their line of actual control but in the area of pangongso which is a disputed area the chinese are presently on the military talks are on the diplomatic talks are on and hopefully india will be able to uh, 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 make china go back to the status quo ante of april 2020 so i uh, i have completed 15 minutes i think dot 15 minutes uh, that's uh, Uh, uh and i'll stop here and should there be any questions i'll be more than happy to uh, take sorry bob being a little fast but i had to cover a lot of things no perfectly fine i mean it's a crash course in in history in that part of the country you know so perfect thank you so much for that really appreciate it and from all the three panelists you know we've had a sort of a down memory lane kind of a thing right from 48 till today here we are on 15th of august 2020 and amazing journey amazing stories a lot of grit a lot of gumption a lot of sacrifice along with a lot of inspiration as well so thank you so much for that before we move on to the next section one last quick reminder to all the attendees here the question and answers need to be coming in now because we are going live and if you do not put your questions in the question box now you have lost the chance of picking the brains of some of the finest from the armed forces so it's all up to you people over to you vivek for the next section and i will be back again in a little while thank you very much for all those thoughts it's been truly wonderful and amazing thank you preeti uh, thank you panelists uh, you know today i've learned something which i had uh, new stories which i had not heard before uh, so thank you very much again uh we have some interesting questions uh, that have come in uh the first uh, question uh, is for general ata hasan uh sir uh, do you think uh, did the indo pak 1948 war create a cfl in the karachi agreement uh, that resulted in pakistan capturing sham jorian and nearly aknu uh, your view your views please ah uh. i couldn't get the first part because there was a little bit of a ping in the in the in the communication can you just tell me the first sentence uh, exactly what it was the indo pak 1948 war created a cfl in the karachi agreement that resulted uh, pakistan capturing cham jorian and nearly okay uh, i hope i can be heard yes okay wait uh 
You see, in 1949, under the Karachi Agreement, the ceasefire took place after fighting this war for almost about 14 months. Uh, you must remember that this war was fought at a time when India had just gained independence, Pakistan had just gained independence. Both nations were in a hurry to get along uh, to do their to do their nation building, and they were stuck in a war which was going on up in North in Kashmir. Uh, certainly, both countries were not keen to continue the war, uh, and that is what led them to actually agree to an, a ceasefire and the establishment of the ceasefire line. Now, how did the ceasefire line? The ceasefire line is different to the international border. Just remember, the CFL ultimately got converted to the LOC in 1972 at the Shimla Agreement. Right? It is actually it's a question of semantics more than anything else. But um, uh, both the CFL and the LOC are very well demarcated on the map, delineated on the map, and on the ground based upon certain features, landmarks on the ground. Very any different to the line of actual control which exists because there is no delineation, there are no maps, there are perceptions of the Chinese and there are perceptions of the Indians. I thought I'd just explain you the difference. The LOC in our case, the CFL, at the time of the CFL and the LOC subsequently, it was virtually an eyeball to eyeball contact because this was an area which became what is called, and the notion of the army is called grabber's keepers. He who grabbed a piece of ground on the line of control tended to keep it unless someone else came and evicted you from there. So you couldn't allow, Colonel Dini explained it very well, you couldn't allow any your enemy to come to any part of the LOC and come and you know sit on it or capture a part of it at that time. Now, what did it have an effect on the 65 uh, operations in Chamjoria? Not decidedly. Chamjoria, the area of Akhnur, crucial strategic, very, very crucial strategically. Why? Because the distance from the from the CFL at that time, the CFL, to the road which runs from Jammu to Aklu to Rajori, the distance is not too much. This is flat open ground territory. Uh, the Pakistanis, they managed to surprise us here. Uh, our intelligence was weak. We didn't have air intelligence which was available. There was no satellite intelligence in those days. They had managed to concentrate a full force on the other side of the CFL, behind certain hill features on the other side, a full force consisting of a new armored division, six armored division, which had been raised, and we were unaware of the raising of the six armored division, even. And so they managed to bring this in, and the temptation for Pakistan to come into Afnur, Chamajoria, is essentially to cut off this road, capture this iron bridge, now the cement bridge at Afnur. But this, if you cut off this road, then the, the, the communication between Jammu and Rajari going on to Punch gets cut. And you will have to adopt uh, alternative routes. Of course, today, today there are more alternative routes available for it. But this is the main route, which is available with the quickest and uh, easiest available route. So the existence of the, existence of the ceasefire line and our inability to push the CFL further. Perhaps if we if we perceive that Afur, perhaps no one perceived that Afur was going to be such a strategically important place. Otherwise, in 68, in 47, 48 itself, we may have endeavored to go further, deeper, give more depth to a place like Afur. But you can't blame commanders. You cannot blame uh, people for that. In, in, a, in, a, in a warlike situation, there are dynamics which uh, keep taking place. Haji Pir, for example. Someone should ask me the question in 60, in 47, 48, we captured Haji Pir, but we could not hold it. We didn't have the winter equipment. We didn't have the winter clothing. We didn't have the logistics to allow our troops to sustain themselves uh, at Haji Pir, and we lost Haji Pir. Haji Pir was used in 1965 by Pakistan for Operation Gibraltar as one of the main bases of Operation Gibraltar. And that's why in 65, we went back to capture it. And we captured it. Now, I will, I will, uh, I will uh, proceed a question. Uh, so I'm sure someone would want to know it. Why did we leave Haji Pir after 65? In Tashkent uh, talks, 10th, 11th, 9th, 10th, 11th of January 1966, uh, we handed over uh, Haji Pir back to Pakistan. A lot of people criticize uh, the government, they criticize the army, they criticize leadership. Why did we do it? There's a simple reason. 
The Pakistanis had come so close to Akhlur, they were four kilometers away from the iron bridge of Akhlur. And we had Haji Pir in our hands. Now, if we left the situation like this with Haji Pir in our hands and that area under Pakistan, then the next round of war, if it took place like it happened in 71, Pakistan would have made one push and probably been able to come and capture us. And that would not have been strategically very advantageous to us. So we had to hand over that. That was the reason. So if you understood the dynamics of the line of control, that is not always easy to, you know, the line of control is, you would like to have it in a certain direction, in a certain alignment, etc. But it's contingent upon how the operations have taken place and where you have finally stopped, where the ceasefire agreement ultimately comes. Yeah. I was on mute. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much for those insights. Uh, uh, I hope that answers uh, the question very clearly. Uh, okay, so we'll move on to the next question. And I think uh, this is also uh, one of my questions. And I think uh, for most Indians, uh, this question is for Colonel Denny. Uh, what are the challenges for obtaining information about the Chinese intentions? Uh, why do we get surprised on the border? Okay. Um... You know, the intentions, uh, it's very difficult to read intentions. And especially if it is a, uh, of, of a country like China, where, you know, we don't even know the basic uh, characteristics of what, what is happening inside, what is happening inside China. You know, there is absolutely uh, a, a iron curtain or a, a kind of a thing which, which is happening inside China. So the intentions of China, probably it is very difficult to, you know, ascertain it to the, to be, um, to a very, uh, to, to a very precise extent, but definitely there are indicators. So we may not uh, uh, know the intent, but we, we know the indicators and the uh, indicators also, uh, you know, generally give a direction. So in this particular, let's, let's talk of this particular issue of uh, uh, the Pengongso issue, which is happening right now. And let's see what intention uh, Ch Chinese had. The Chinese never gave out any intention of coming into in a, such a uh, massive way uh, as what they did. Because of many reasons, uh, the intention also didn't make any, uh, because of, uh, firstly, uh, it, it was on the backdrop of a lot of uh, the highest political level leadership meets, which had summits, which had happened both in Wuhan and Mahabalipuram. So there was a kind of a, a atmosphere of wherein uh, both countries were now moving into a little more kind of, of closer relationship. Then you had uh, the COVID uh, kind of a crisis, which was there. And in such a scenario, you know, to have uh, uh, the kind of deployment and the kind of mobilization which they did, I, I don't think anybody could re, uh, read the intention uh, if, if what they're doing. So that is why my theory on this is that even this particular issue, which is there, and I may be wrong, I'm not saying that I may be I'm a, a right, but my, what I'm saying is that even in, uh, given these circumstances and given what strategic gain did they get, do after having done this, is it about just about eight kilometers of Disputed ter territory of about forty square kilometers is what are, is is what what is the is the, is that what China is looking at when they're aspiring to be a superpower? You know, other than that, there's not, of course there's been casualties on both sides. They have lost a, 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 a not a friend but definitely a, a partner, a strategic partner in India. Today, you if, if going by any polls, there is so much of backlash against China in India and of course around the world. So what is the kind of gain which they did? Is it for territorial gain? I don't think so. So what you know what my I strongly believe is that they were led into it by their own actions on the ground is why is, is what I believe and that is why the intention, the strategic in, intent which they had the Chinese intent we could never uh, you know we could never understand. Of course there are occasions like in 1962 wherein uh, the, the, they had an intention and we couldn't read and uh, we, we, we played into their hands. Those things, uh, of course, there are, for that also, there are two different uh, uh, school of thoughts. But yes, in this particular thing, given the circumstances in which these things happen, I think it is very difficult to uh, ascertain what their intentions uh, were. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Colonel Dini, for that answer. Uh, all right, so we will move uh, to our next question. Um, this is for General Consul. Uh, so the question is, uh, the Naga Accord has lasted for a decade plus now. Are there lessons to be learned here uh, as in how to solve ethnic conflicts? Okay, uh, Naga Accord actually, uh, the peace talks, so-called, 
have been on since 1997. And uh, a framework agreement was signed on 3rd of August, 2015. And today, it means around 3rd of August, five years later, 2020, there is a little uh, ambiguity. Interpretations by the authorities and interpretations by the Naga group's leadership, they are differing in their views of, you know, interpretation of what they have signed. Is this because of change kind of a mindset? Or is it because of their change of heart? Or is it because of um, purely misunderstanding of the agreement itself? This is not known because uh, this development is just last about maybe last 10 days or so. I see a lot of hope. There have been so many success stories of ethnic conflicts in the Northeast. One I gave you was the Mizo by creating that state of Mizoram. And Bodo, uh, you know, Bodo, Bodos are part of Assam, you know, uh, their population approximately 4 million. And there are also other success stories of small, small groups. But the major groups in the Northeast of the Naga insurgency group, the Manipur insurgency group, and a small faction of Assam, this is faction of Ulfa, which I, which I mentioned earlier, United Liberation Front of Assam, is yet to fructify today. I, my opinion, if you're asking that is there any scope for any solution, I think there is a lot of scope. The Indian democracy uh, gives ample opportunity to everyone. This needs to be understood by the communicated and understood by the militant groups. There are people, they have to be, uh, uh, you know, you have to do much more to actually uh, proactively reach out to them. And uh, we need to talk and we need to talk real, engage them really, you know, in the sense that on, uh, on concrete terms, not on some, uh, you know, uh, something which doesn't uh, uh, happen on ground. For example, I give you the example of the Naga, shared sovereignty, you know, in that framework, framework agreement of 2015, shared sovereignty. The Naga groups interpret it as that we are two sovereign parties. Whereas the an Indian representative says that shared sovereignty, I mean, we are all one. Everybody is sovereign. We are all sovereign when we share the sovereignty of India. So these are perceptual issues which, uh, uh, you know, in the tribal society, uh, uh, particularly in the Northeast and all, they believe in straight talking. Not too much of this, you know, playing around with uh, playing around with words and things like that. So uh, there's a lot of hope in the long-term development, long-term reaching out, understanding, uh, you know, inter-ethnic uh, understanding, and also a political will to do it and in, uh, to uh, to reach uh, uh, you know some kind of a compromise, political will within the framework of you know indian constitution my uh, hunch is that if you give a little there are uh, you know they want more and more every ethnic group and we have to be watchful of the interested you know elements around the china factor the isi factor and then the instability in uh, northern myanmar and all that so i'm very confident that uh, things will uh, Things will be, you know, come to normalcy, provided we know what we are talking and provided we, we uh, talk what we mean on ground. Thank you. Thank you, General Ponson, for that uh, uh, very enlightening.
So I will uh, now request Amit to take over. Um, any further questions, please. Thank you, Vivek. And the next question that we have is for uh, Atta Hassan. This question is coming in about the nation's youth. Uh, the question is, sir, do you propose that we involve our youth in the nation's defense? And is the five-year tour of duty proposal? Again, a slight audio problem, Amit, at the end. Can you once again say the last part? I, I, I know about the youth involvement in defense activities, but in the last part, what did you say? So there was a situation which was being floated around that the uh, duty in which there will be a short engagement uh, uh, serving with the armed forces for maybe five years. It was a proposal floated around. I don't know the dynamics of it. So probably this is what they're trying to plan for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, hearing the Prime Minister this morning, probably this question probably comes out from there. And uh, he has spoken about at least one lakh NCC cadets in the border areas and the coastal areas being involved in specialized training or focused training. That's not called specialized training, focused training. Uh, those who are residing or the, who are generally in the areas around air bases will be given air, air force type of training. Those who are uh, at the land borders, near the land borders to be given uh, army type of training. And those who are in the coastal areas to be given maritime training. Uh, and also that one third of them uh, should be Girls should be should be young from, from the female side, right? Um, I think this is a phenomenal idea. The NCC had started, uh, well, if I say it had started becoming, it was idealist to my mind. It was just there and uh, very nice to see them on, on uh, NCC day on parades and things like that. But uh, uh, their meaningful involvement, and I think I think the youth has much more in it. And uh, I'm sure the NCC director is going to be very, very enthused by this. Uh, they are already doing a stupendous job, the NCC director, too, with all the uh, resources that they have to keep them motivated, etc. But now with this focus at the national level, and the Prime Minister taking ownership of a thing like this, I'm sure this is one domain which will develop towards the youth involvement and contribution towards defense action. Number one. Number two, before I come to the last part of your question, which is very important, three-year, five-year engagement period, are we requiring to go in for, 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 a, for some kind of a, a compulsory uh, involvement with the armed forces, etc. But before that, uh, I think while reading out my resume, it was also revealed that I am a member of the National Disaster Management Authority. Remember, disaster is also related to security national security. A lot of people think that what does this have to do with national security? See, COVID-19. COVID-19 is part of national security. It is compromised on your resources, on your ability to achieve your aspirations as a nation. And when there's anything which compromises your ability to achieve your aspirations as a nation affects your national security. So COVID-19 affects your national security. So similarly, floods, fires, cyclones, anything which comes and you know, on for which you have to spend so much, which affects lives, livelihoods, economies of um, um, of states, of, of areas. All this is a part of national security. The National Disaster Management Authority has started a, a program called the Apda Mitra, which means a friend for disaster, for, for, for disaster management. And uh, at the moment, it is just volunteers, nothing else across the board. We have a lot of training being given to them and uh, you know, meaningful training being given to them by the NDRF uh, uh, in terms of uh, some very good swimmers being taken on board, some divers being taken on board for areas in the flood, flood hit areas or cyclone hit areas, etc. Uh, people who are very good at, uh, very fearless in their, in their approach to us fires, uh, forest fires and things like that. So, this is, a, again, a domain which is at the youth contributing to national security. And the last question of here, the last part of it, do we require a national footprint of the entire youth coming in and uh, doing three years, two years, three years, four years, five years compulsory service? 
I think, uh, number one, I don't think the size of our armed forces uh, affords that opportunity to give this, uh, to give a chance to every male recruitable person or a female recruitable person in the country. I, I don't think that is that is at the moment possible. Someone could do a study on it, but to my mind, it's not possible. What a lot of people do talk about is that if you want a government uh, employment, if you're looking for a whatever type of government uh, employment, then a two year or a three year experience in the armed forces, I mean, maybe Air Force, should be necessary. This will help you understand national security at the borders, at the maritime zone, etc. It will uh, give you a sense of a greater sense of patriotism, a greater sense of achievement, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, a better integration between the civil and the military domains, which is one of the biggest challenges, let me tell you. It's one of the biggest challenges for our, for our effectiveness of the armed forces. The inability of the civilian domain to understand the culture of the armed forces. Our culture is something quite different. Our style of working is very different. But if people who have service here, who have experience in the armed forces go and serve the nation, Look at the Ministry of Defense. If you have an integrated defense ministry where you have armed forces people also serving there and you have experienced bureaucrats who have been in the army, armed navy or air force also serving there, imagine the kind of difference it will make in attitudes. So that that kind of a thing, I'm definitely for it. And perhaps we may move towards it sometime in the, in the future. Sir, and uh, I think the part that, is, uh, that you said about that there has to be a communication between the armed forces and the general public at large. Uh, that is extremely uh, important on the way ahead. Uh, the uh, constant the next question is to you. This is coming in from Rebellion Court. And this is about what lessons can we learn from the wars that we have fought about crisis management and how do you relate it to the present scenario? I think uh, they're trying to sort of combine the COVID crisis as an opportunity for learning about crisis management during war. Your view, sir. Amit, was the question to me? Sir, yes. I couldn't hear you, actually. Uh, your voice was breaking. Uh, can I repeat your it? audio is uh, your audio is echoing uh, uh, Amit because of that it is we can't decipher what you're saying uh, yeah if you can type it out maybe it may be better I'll just uh, sort of type it also for uh... Uh, Pithi, if you can see the question in the Q a uh, could you do that please right um, I would just take this um... Didn't confirm. This is from uh, Rupinder Kaur, and she goes, "What lessons can we learn from the wars about crisis management in the present scenario?" Very interesting question. In fact, this question should have been put to General Hasnain actually, but I will attempt. We, the, the military, the military is used to facing the crisis situation from day to day, you know. And uh, today's, um, uh, this, I, I suppose you are referring to the COVID-19 issue. COVID-19, are you referring to the COVID-19 issue? So, yes. Okay. So, dealing with COVID-19, issue. Prime Minister and everybody has said that this is also a war against COVID-19. So most of the principles of crisis management in the military will be generally, to my opinion, in my mind, they will be generally applicable. You know, generally applicable. For example, you have, you know, uh, the appreciation of the situation, knowing the enemy, you know, knowing the enemy, knowing the situation, reading the battle, and thereafter taking action, pro proactive action, discipline, 
and then uh, taking risk, people on the front line, support by the groups, you know, various others, those today, the situation is the health workers are the front line uh, uh, warriors. Similarly, unless you support them, the entire country or the entire population are with them, the war will not be success. Much as much as when the soldiers are fighting the war, if the nation is not with them, they will not be success. So there are many principles uh, that is applicable in fighting this war as much as the crisis situation that we face day to day in army. In fact, in my own state, some of the advice that I have given is primarily based on the military experience that we have as, as to how to combat, how to uh, you know, manage the situation of such nature. So I think it is quite uh, relevant. And uh, General Atta Hasnan being from the national, uh, he's a very senior uh, the same functionary in the NDMA. And also for his, him, uh, Atta say you may be able to throw some more light on this because... <laughs> Thank you, uh, General Ketch. Thank you. you. You've explained it uh, marvelously in terms of the uh, applicability of the principles of war. Uh, and in the principles of war, one, one of the principles which I would definitely be the first principle of war is the selection and maintenance of aim. Uh, in the armed forces, people should be aware we do not function without first identifying our aim. What is our aim? The aim can be multiple. We can have all kinds of aims. Right? In crisis situations also, like what's happening in the dark today, what is your aim? Is your aim to defeat China and capture territory, uh, the whole of Axai Chin? Or is it to contain China and diplomatically handle the situation to uh, emerge as, a, as, a, as an equal with China in the eyes of the international community? You see, unless your aim is clear, none of these situations can easily be managed. And that is uh, one of the things that we in the military always involve ourselves with. The, one of the other principles of war is flexibility, right? Where you say that uh, once you have once you have decided what you're going to do, based upon your aim, you've established your, your plan, etc. You can't be rigid about your plan. You can't say the plan is the only way the things will be done. Now you have to have you have to have a degree of flexibility. Go right, go left, and you should have. Remember one simple thing about, about situations in the army. The first casualty in the, of any war is the plan. The plan which you make and you start unrolling the plan from the moment go, the plan will have to start changing. So if you've got a rigid mind, and your mind is not willing to accept change, then you will never succeed. And these are the things, things which come in handy in crisis. Uh, many times I think uh, Prime Minister Modi is actually a soldier. He, he's, he's got uh, many of his, many of the characteristics of a soldier. You know, very crystal clear in his, in, in, in his, in his uh, aim, uh, flexible in his approach and things like that. And this is the kind of thing which is applicable to senior leadership anywhere. Why only generalships? Why, why only the military? This is applicable anywhere and that is what we talk about strategic culture. That if you have the ideas of strategic culture, then this is the thing which you can appreciate and apply. Thank you for that, uh, General SAH. With that, we are just about out of time. So my quick question to all of you, rather it is pieces of advice that I'm seeking uh, from each of you very, very briefly in terms of, again, from your experience of the armed forces, the discipline and everything else, whatever is going ar around us right now, what is your couple of uh, pieces of advice each for people to make sure that they tied on the other side of it in the same way as they went in? You know, so it's all about management of your um, mental faculties, your uh, emotions, your all of it. How as armed forces people, you go into a war knowing fully well, you might, you might not come back. This for the common people looks like a war wherein they do not know what is going to happen next. Couple of pieces of advice to sail them through this. 
uh, point in time. I will start with uh, Colonel Dini this time, sir, with your permission. Thank you. Uh, sure, ma'am. When you're speaking of it, are you referring to the COVID crisis or are you referring to the issues at, uh, at, the, at the border? Exactly. Could you just elaborate on that, please? I can't hear you too well. I'm sorry, Colonel Dini. Uh, I, I was mentioning uh, when you were referring to crisis, uh, which crisis are you referring to? In I, I am I'm asking about the current pandemic situation. Oh, right. As uh, forces people who day in, day out live in crisis, what is your couple of advice to make sure that the common man goes out on the other end of it unscathed? All right. Thank you. Great. So one of the first thing which comes, uh, I think, in most of the uh, uh, 4G mind is that this shall also pass. You know, right from our academy days, when uh, or to the you know remotest of uh, posts, sitting alone or fighting, uh, sitting in the ambush for hours together, we know that this shall also pass. So this is what the first message which comes to my mind, and that that, and that is what uh, which I want to uh, convey to you, to the citizens and others, as that this shall also pass. Everything has to pass. Second is that uh, that as General Hasnain also was just mentioning that you know uh, that we have to be a little flexible in our approach. We can't be having the same set of solution as you know what we had for a normal kind of a scenario this covid is not a normal scenario it's a it's a once in a you know century kind of a thing we last had this kind of a pandemic in back in i think 1919 when it was uh, when we had the spanish flu and so after that almost 100 years now we are having it of course the frequency can you know get a little more now coming into all those kind of development but then this is not a usual thing so therefore we have to have a flexible kind of thing. If we are told that do not go outside unnecessarily, so you have to you have to adapt that. Okay, now I have an urge, but I will not go. So those kind of self-discipline, that that thing has to come in. So that is how you know those kind of values from the armed forces, which can be imbibed by in the in the time of uh, in the crisis. And the third thing is that we have to stand for each other. And as the armed forces, we the do is that we as a team member, we stand for each other. So one for all and all for one. Today, when your neighbor or somebody else is in, is in a problem, stand for them because this is the time where you can actually reach out and be empathetic and you can help out. So these are the few thoughts which I think can be taken from the armed forces. Thank you very much for that. Very pertinent advice. Sometimes it's just the simple things really, which you know become sort of very essential for one's own survival. Thank you very much. I'll come to you, General Consum. Um, what do you think? Um, what can help us? A uh, couple of things, please. Over to you. Thank you. Carl Dini has uh, given uh, many good points. I have only one point. That is, you know, isolation. Isolation is something in the army, particularly in the infantry, uh, which three of us belong to. Most of the time in our service, we are, I have 40 years in the army. We have been isolated. I'll give you one example and enjoyed it, huh? enjoyed it. In Siachen Glacier, I stayed inside the ice tunnel for 15 days because the Pakis won't allow me to come out because they knew that there is a commanding officer there, you know. 15 days in a ice tunnel. And I enjoyed it with my troops. In fact, it was a great resting area. So obey the orders, the rules that have been let down don't get bored with yourself. Enjoy the isolation that military has. This is the only lesson that I will, uh, I'll give you my own example. Like five months of isolation, I have just completed a book. Uh, Atta, sir, I have just completed a book. It'll come out in November. <laughs> so that is how in the military we do it. You know, enjoy that isolation. It is your for your good. That is the only thing that I can, you know, uh, add to what Colonel kind of Dini has said. Thank you very much for that. It's really important and relevant because, again, it's a very simple thing of how if you keep yourself safe, only then can you keep your surroundings safe. So just follow the rules and make sure that, right. you know, right. we do not spread uh, the cause of concern anymore. Thank you very much for that, General. Over to you, General SAH, your final um, words of caution. And before that, uh, General SAH, one quick uh, thing. Um, Rupinder Kaur has asked another question, and I am saying this to her, that I will reach out to you via email to get a response to that particular question. She has written about uh, women getting permanent commission in the army and what are your views on uh, diversity in the armed forces now. But sir, because of the lack of time, I am going to reach out to you and get that response on email. But it is over to you now for your advice. 
to tide this crisis. Thank you very much. First, firstly, thank you. Thank you, Preeti. I thought Colonel Dini and General um, KH have put across their views marvelously, very, very well. And I'll only add a, a little bit to it, but I will also answer this question on, on women in the army. Uh, I am completely 100% for women's role of the women in the armed forces. And I've always supported it. Uh, you'll be surprised after the Supreme Court decision, women who were involved in that Supreme Court case, I really have to say, we took a lot of inspiration from you. We took a lot of things from what you had written in the media. So I'm happy to, to state that here. My only, only reservation is we may have to take our time to take decision on women in a combat role. When the women and in infantry, whether the women in the cavalry and the armored corps, that may take a little more time. It may happen ultimately. It depends upon what the environment is going to be. Right. Having said that, my uh, aspect on uh, my, my my brief comment on the COVID-19 situation and the isolation, particularly which John Kerr spoke about. Let me tell you, I've done a couple of talks for corporates on a subject called living with uncertainty. And the corporates were one, they were thrilled to have this. I did it with a number of very high profile companies. I told them, see, we live with uncertainty all the time. And so do you actually live with uncertainty. It's a different kind of uncertainty. Now you're living with COVID-19, you don't know, you are living in isolation, you don't know where that little virus is going to come from and strike you, right? How, what kind of precautions you have to take. So. Like John Kerr said, from isolation, from isolation, take advantage of it. I would say one of the greatest things happening to you from isolation is family bonding. We in the army don't get a chance to do that. Right? I mean, after 40 years, I'm living with my family inside the house. But I, unfortunately, I'm one of those who goes to office every day because of being part of the NDA way. But otherwise, I'm not going anywhere. Evenings, we are always at the family here. We rediscovered ourselves um, much, much better. And I'll end by only telling you the aspect of unpredictability in the armed forces and the mind of the soldier, how it comes in handy to understand that mind and be like that in your, in your everyday life. When I took over my unit in the Siachen Glacier, Northern Glacier, uh, I can tell you on the day one, I lost an officer. Day one. He was speaking to me. At the battalion, I was at the battalion headquarters and he was on a post, forward post. He was speaking to me and telling me, sir, when are you coming to visit me here? And uh, and, and, his, and his operator suddenly picked up the telephone and told me, uh, the SAT is no more. Because he got a bullet right under his eye from a distance of four kilometers. And his body dropped on the other side. We had to spend an almost 48 hours to get his body out. That is the unpredictability factor. Can you imagine? I mean, you're speaking to a commanding officer and, 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 and you're exchanging niceties at the one time and suddenly you are dead. You don't know. Uh, this is what life and death is all about in the armed forces for which we are mentally prepared all the time. This is something for which the public needs to be prepared all the time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those kind words of advice and caution, General SH. With that, we are at a close of this evening. And first of all, thank you to all the attendees that have come out listen to us patiently down memory lanes in terms of exigencies and hardships and life at the same time. Thank you so much to the panel, generals, colonel, my co-hosts, Vivek and Amit, and everybody else from here saying goodbye, take care, see you on the other side. There's lots more to come. Please keep watching the posts. Keep we Please keep an eye out on LinkedIn for our other efforts. But from now, for now, it is thank you for your service, gentlemen, again. A very happy Independence Day and take care.